Here are the contents of the talk. Uh, first, I'll give you the brief introduction on, on the subject of the PhD work that I'm trying to do. Then I will follow it by method or proxy that I use in my studies. And then I will straight away jump to results from two sites, Lake Gal El Bazar and Lake Ramshara. And then I'll conclude with that. So coming to introduction. So there are various in paleoclimate, there are different kinds of climatic studies. There is short term, there is long term. However, what I am interested in is to study short climate So for that, Urosin is considered to be the most ideal time period to work on. Why? Because there are too many short events happening in Urosin and which previous studies have been recorded. And here you see the changes in temperature for last 18,000 years. And we see when the Urosin started around 12,000 years, we see increase of temperature. And it reached maximum around like 6,000 years, and then it dips around mid Holocene. And then we see in late Holocene, there are you see some bulges here during some minor transition, like the medieval warming period as well as Middle Ice Age. However, these changes are very small compared to big paleoclimatic changes, but they have a significant impact on uh, social economic conditions of the people living in different parts of the world. What interests me is this uh, last 4,000 years, which is late Holocene. Uh, why? Because there is, there is an ongoing debate that whether the climate of late Holocene was majorly impacted by natural variability or as well as the But since last two decades, we have been focused more on past two years, which I want to mention, uh, last 2,000 years and in 1999, uh, there was this particular hockey graph was published by Manetel, which basically shows that current temperature is even way more than medieval warming period, so which is quite alarming. So here they say that after 1800s, the climate has been impacted by humans, but what about before 1800s from an era? So uh, various simulation has been proposed by various papers, and you can see all the records of past 2000 years with the in this and you know what I see here that there are no records in Arabia, or there is no record in uh, Shahara districts. So, if you want to come conclusively whether the climate of the uh, past 2000 years is impacted by natural or ecological activity, you need to add more data points in this part of the world. Uh, that brings me to my research questions, which are primarily three whether the climate of Arabia or southern Arabia or Arabian desert is very documented. Specifically for Lake Orosi, the answer is no, because on the left hand side you can see the compilations of all the Orosi records. You can see a list of the names if you want to see, you want to decide if you are familiar with. And here, none of the records have Lake Orosi continuous validated sites, it's like international records. There are some marine uh, records from the Indian Ocean, but, uh, but still, that's one of our major uh, research motivation. Second is what is what controls the regional climate? How ITC is that basically impacts the, the region. And the third major objective is how well these uh, climate anomalies, like medieval climate anomalies and little ice, has impacted in the region. So for that, before going to paleoclimatic uh, things, I want to discuss about modern precipitation data. Uh, uh, because it is important to understand first modern climate and then jump to paleoclimatology. Uh, so the modern precipitation data says that the northern Arabia regularly gets most of the rainfall during months of winter, whereas southern Arabia and central Arabia receives uh, rainfall during months of spring and summer. Now this modern climate data set doesn't provide the comprehensive picture that is going in this region. We have witnessed uh, the last two decades a uh, snowstorm, dust, flooding in the region. And the same year, when you have drought in north, you have flooding in the south. So, this indicates there is also special inhomogeneity in the modern data set. 
as well as the electricity. Uh, if I specifically talk about Yemen, uh, we all remember the year 2020, uh, Corona year, uh, when this region received extreme precipitation during winters, which they are not supposed to get during that time, and that led to extreme low cost infestation, and that led to get a huge food insecurity in the region. So, how do we understand this modern climate? So, there are two major monsoon zones impacting this region. The first is East Arctic monsoon, which is, is active during months of spring, and the other one is uh, Indian summer monsoon. And these both monsoons are majorly like uh, controlled by this red dotted line, which is that is high peak in that boundary. The more this boundary goes north, you have more precipitation coming from the Indian Ocean or other areas. Whereas in the winter, you have Mediterranean cycle as well as northeast monsoon. However, this doesn't impact the yellow region, so we can see the more of them for now. Uh, that brings me to the recent objectives, uh, which is to increase the Special coverage of failure data sets, understand the role of IDC in the regional climate, and the third major objective that I'm trying to achieve during my PhD is to test the general various climate sensitive proxies like Osterbot biomarkers, which has been successfully applied in the tropical and subtropical climate, have not been applied in any setting like the Yemen or the Desert, and to estimate the response of climate change on the ecosystem, that is one of the major objectives also. And the last objective is to estimate the impact of climate change on humans or the other way around. As I mentioned, that we don't know during the Holocene whether climate was impacting humans or humans were impacting. So for that, we selected two sites. As you can see, they are very closely uh, situated uh, near the boundary. And the first lake is Rats Kexi, Old uh, Lake Gaia and Bazaar. And the second one is volcanic crater uh, lake by Charwan. They are made, situated in a very similar climatic sensitive zone, but geologically or geomorphologically, these two lakes are quite different. So, whatever kind of climatic signature we get from this will say different things. Coming to the methods, I will just summarize very quickly to save the time. But normally, it involves we take, we identify the lake settings. When we do the field uh, work, we take various short and long course and also take various catchment and vegetation sampling. However, in my case, the samples were already taken by a group of biologists from Brown universities in 2001, and the course were stored for the next 20 years in Minnesota. So, and we got access in 2020 to work on that. And then, once we have the core uh, in our lab, we can prepare the working packages. We will start with taking good photos to uh, detect composite cores and then uh, strategize our sampling strategies. We first uh, do non descriptive analysis like uh, micro XRF, etc., and then we will do And regarding the proxies, I have divided into three working packages which are chemical, physical, and biological proxies. And chemical proxies will basically tell you the sources of sediments. Physical proxies like rain site will tell us about the depositional condition of the lake setting, and biological proxies are the which I discussed. Now, coming to the first chapter of my thesis, which was published in 2022, in 20 years, um, where we worked on this particular lake, Lake Island Bazaar. Uh, so, coming to the regional city. So uh, we see that uh, this, as I mentioned, this lake is a karstic sinkhole lake, and this formed due to dissolution of gypsum and limestone. And uh, there are no major rivers coming into the lake basin. However, there are like wadi inputs that becomes active during the month of spring or during uh, summer seasons, and is the major source of uh, water in the region. And now you can see the bottom most figure that the lake is completely covered by various uh, farms and houses. It is anthropogenically impacted, and we have collected three sediment core from this site. And as I mentioned, the methodology we took at the composite site, and then we did the major carbon dating, uh, and it goes up to like 100 years, and it's based on five years dating on wood. And we also try to calculate the reservoir effect. We calculated these uh, ages with the latest calculation curve 2020. Uh, coming directly to the results, first we looked at geochemical data. We see that uh, 
we use these two particular ratios, which is titanium versus aluminium and calcium versus uh, iron titanium aluminium. Basically, titanium indicates more one input, and calcium ratio indicates more oxygenic uh, calcium precipitation. High value of titanium indicates more one input, more rainfall. The high value of calcium indicates less uh, one input and low molecular conditions. Similarly, we also interpreted MSCL and POC values followed by grade size. This is what I did in my PhD. Uh, I not only did the grade size analysis and divided into KSL fractions, I analyzed the data with the uh, number approach, which basically tells you about the transport mechanism of the sediments and reveals me two major fractions with EM1 represents the body flux and EM2 indicates more dust into the region. And we related these results with uh, various forcing like SOLAR, and we identified two major events, which is MCA and LIA. LCA is wet uh, or warm conditions, and uh, LIA is dry and cool. Now, not only we did uh, these telegrammic analysis, we also compared with the other available records. I mentioned that there are not many available records in the region. But somehow we compared our results to East Africa or the marine records from there. We saw some slight uh, variations with a few uh, available records for LCA and LIA. However, for the Arabian Sea, we don't see any much fluctuation. Arabian Sea record is shown by F and G. So you can see there are not much record that I can really compare with. Coming to the summary, we recognize two major events MCA, LIA, we compared our results with different earlier records. And this is the first very continuous echo strand record from Southern Arabia that reliably tells us about MCA and LIA. So this summarizes the first chapter of my thesis. Now, the second paper that I published in 2023 basically deals with how these climatic changes impact the regional ecosystem. So for that, I use these three biological proxies, like alkanes, phosphor, and chironomics. So I, as I mentioned earlier in the slide, that these before applying these proxies, we need to test that these proxies are eligible to apply or not. So how do we test it? So we compare our results with, uh, with the previously published paper. So we divided the four into various zones, wet and dry, and then we, we wanted to compare with the Various bioindicators, and we see that for NRDs, uh, so those of you who are not aware of like uh, NRDs or biomarkers, alkanes have three major sources. You can see on the right side of the slide, so the algae is aquatic plants and terrestrial plants, and they all produce unique signature uh, based on their gene lengths. And using this ratio, we can calculate how much organic matter is coming from aquatic plants or from terrestrial plants, and based on that, we can know that. The source of organic matter in the lake basin, and we see that during new events like MCA, we are getting more aquatic plant uh, contribution. Whereas in the dry uh, uh, intervals like LIA, we are getting more contributions from terrestrial plant. This can be explained how that during new event the water is bringing more a lot of nutrients and is depositing into the lake, and that is resulting in more aquatic plant booming. Around these intervals. Uh, moving to another biological indicator, which is osteopods. We identified four major species, uh, and each species represents a unique environment. For example, bleeding elka mostly are found in uh, freshwater, is a freshwater species, whereas western eula and cylindrosi tree are mostly found in coastaline or more uh, harsh conditions because they are non similar uh, osteopod species. And we see correlation with the with the available uh, wet climate. We see more uh, presence of Pelinata in Western Dona, whereas in the dry intervals we see higher values of Vestibula and the other one. Going to pyramids, one last indicator. These pyramids are basically like uh, mosquitoes with other bite, and we see that uh, and uh, that in the dry intervals they are getting more of amount, amounts of pyramids uh, capsule preserved. And this is because when the lake level goes down, you have more oxygen that results in more uh, production. Taking it when you lay more eggs, when the lake level is low, because they don't like to they, they normally like to stay in the top of the lake surface. So we see more pyramids during dry climate conditions. And this basically summarizes whatever I have done in this work. 
when there's a wet climate conditions, we see more uh, uh, aquatic plants, we see uh, less salinity, we see more abundance of swimmer species of hospitals, whereas with the dry heat spell, we see the complete opposite. Uh, coming to a brief summary of this work, we have tested the efficacy of these three particular proxies. We have tried to successfully. Uh, we try to uh, understand the paleoanomaly condition in the given view. That's the major inference for this paper. And then one uh, extra uh, paper that we plan uh, this year to be published is on the phenomenon assemblage data sets, where we see that uh, after 1700s, we are getting a mixed signal that these phenomenons are not being impacted by climate. This we have uh, related with the more anthropogenic activity in the region. And this we correlated with another biological uh, proxies like Coposinol. And we see more abundance of Coposinol after 1500s when we try to estimate the population based on the land cover data sets. And we see the population is also rising when the Coposinol uh, concentration is increasing. These two data sets we are trying to publish within the next six months or something. Uh, going to the last uh, chapter of my thesis, which is uh, based on Lake Karib Shauran. Uh, this particular lake is a volcanic crater lake, and uh, the walls of this particular lake is quite steep. It is made up of various olivine and pyroxene rich rocks. We collected two cores from this lake, and just like how we did for the first. Uh, Lake samples, we did the composites, we did the lithology, and not only we uh, did this, we also got the age for this one meter long core. The age goes up to 4,000 years based on four radiocarbon dates, well calibrated with the reservoir corrections. Um, and then not only we did uh, the micro XRF, we did the XRF of each lamina and to identify which kind of elements or minerals. Are basically laminas are made up of. So, like for example, we have a lamina of daylight and uh, early dead rest. So, how do we identify them in the human condition? So, coming to results again here, first we started with geotechnical proxies like calcium and domain. The calcium indicates more presence of uh, trial environment, whereas domain indicates more marine flux into the lake basin. Similarly, we have physical proxies with very details about the deportation conditions, and we also did biological proxies like biomarker osteopods. Here we have developed a new uh, proxies based on osteopods, where we not only qualitatively cover told about the salinity of the lake, we have quantified using CU more morphology data set as well as isotopes. And how do we interpret these data sets using uh, principal component analysis? And we see that uh, majorly all the dry proxies, which they represent dry conditions, are forming one cluster in the same orbit. Uh, where halide EM2 calcite salinities are forming one clusters. And the, all the proxies that indicate uh, wet climate conditions <laughs> are shown in the left side of PC1. So we can use this particular loading to know how much, how much, how wet the climate was. So if the PC1 value was higher, we know it's more prior condition. If it's less, it means it's less uh, arid or it's more precipitation conditions. And we compared these results with the various histological records. Uh, so if you ask what is this ABCD, so these are basically all the dynasties and kingdoms in Sabine Kingdom, and we see a good correlation when the climate is wet. We are getting the kingdoms are flourishing, and when the dry phase starts, the uh, kingdom starts to collapse. Uh, the D is the Himalayan kingdom, which basically survived the uh, uh, dry climate spell. But after when late into the Little Ice Age, we see the rise of the ESS climate dynasty. So not only we recognize uh, the uh, various climatic events like 4.2 RWP uh, late into the Little Ice Age, whatever climate and Little Ice and Little Ice as well. We also understood the we try to relate this data to the various historical record. So it indicates this region was extremely uh, like this social economic conditions were dependent on climate. If there is a wet, wet climate, we see emergence of a dynasty. The dry climate is collapsed. Dynasty.
Uh, this uh, summary of this work, we have recognized various events. We try to relate our failure uh, planet data to various historical data, and we see a good correlation between these two things. Now, coming to the final conclusion of my thesis. Now, as I mentioned about IPCZ when we started off the presentation, that that boundary basically determines how much value the object will receive. So, there are two models that they have proposed the proposed IPC boundaries, which is by Bigman, Prince Shoki, and also by Renner. I actually disagree with both of them. I think it's much more southern. You can read what was in our policy because if the boundaries are that extreme north, then we should not have any strong uh, short plan to the economies during the ecology. And uh, we also recognize various uh, regional climate drivers like Red Sea Group, which currently has impacted the climate of the region, and it is heavily dependent on the end soil wells. So we have tried to uh, add this thing in my thesis uh, during the discussion of the papers to include these regional climate drivers. Uh, coming to the final conclusion of my thesis, the final conclusion is we, uh, we had we have very high resolution, high resolution, continental scale climate variability in Southern Arabian Desert. We recognize a lot of climatic events. We understood the role of IPCZ and its uh, role and its impact on regional climate. We tested a lot of various proxies that we use for paleoromental and paleoclimatic uh, construction. And we also compared uh, the impact of humans on the ecosystem between the first wave, the Lake Lion Nodal, whereas climate impact of humans was estimated in the Lake Garden Shoran. And obviously, this is not my alone contribution. I had uh, help from a lot of uh, people from the university to uh, various collaborators. Like, obviously, uh, Nicholas Waldman helped me uh, edit this course. Uh, there are the Ilaria Mazini helped me uh, understand these. Uh, Osterboard analysis, James Russell from Brown University, Anupopili, my master supervisor, who helped me with biomark analysis, uh, Daniel, uh, various other collaborators like Sonia, Ankit, they helped me with my analysis and uh, guiding this uh, research forward. And obviously, to the Petrol Arrows, they deserve a good award that this year will be during this journey. And uh, we also acknowledge the various. Uh, Funding agencies like the uh, IES uh, Council for Higher Education, EBC, which basically give me funds during the start of my PhD, ISF, and CSD facility. And I would also like to thank our department who provide this opportunity to work on various multidisciplinary projects. And that's all from my side. And if you have any questions, please feel free to go to. Thank you very much. Uh, we have questions. You can hear you. Boundary is, is a like a fictional boundary. There is nothing like that. It's what the meteorologists they create this boundary. But what the it signifies is if it's way more northward, you have more monsoons coming from the south. So now my both the lakes are situated very close to the Arabian Sea. So 
if it's going more and more northwards, I should not get any dry phase. I should not get any major dry phase during late weather. You understand? If it's going more and more northward, I should not get any dry spell. So that's why um, I, it's difficult to put a, like a boundary. Like what they have done is also like a hypothetical scenario. But according to my data sets uh, from this region, we can say that it is not not north, uh, like uh, it should be between the proposed model. Uh, it should be somewhere around here, what I believe. It should be around the here, average position. Not like uh, every year it can go to, it can come to Israel. Like, uh, it should, every position should be around this. That's my hypothesis. Can be wrong. And their future works need to be done. Now this is a Yes, it's there is no like if you measure it today, it will be somewhere in the south, it can be in the north. It is like a hypothetical number. So above IPC that there is no rate. Yes, I did. I uh, in the first paper I, I showed you that uh, there are uh, we compared it with uh, various uh, marine records. Sorry, put the name on the top, C, G, uh, and F are the marine records, but in, these are like the last one is a record from the Gulf of Ada, which is the closest marine record from Yemen. And you can see there is no sea surface temperature deviation between C and I. And this is, I can explain, this is what I have explained in my paper also, because marine record doesn't uh, show fluctuation very quickly. In 200 years for marine is nothing. But for terrestrial record, we will see a huge change. It's a lesson. Okay. The age model is very like uh, we have 60 centimeter, we have like 100 200 years of record, and then rest 30 centimeter. I have like rest uh, 4000. That's why we have more data points on the top. Uh, the resolution is very high on the top, but when we go down, the resolution is, is dropping. So, uh, yeah, because uh, uh, I can show you, like in the photos, you will identify there is a like a slow failure. Uh, yeah. It's a slow failure in uh, about 30 centimeter, which we have neglected for the federal families because we believe it's uh, it's earthquake, but we don't have a lead to ten age to confirm this whether it's pinpointing uh, that particular event. There was an event 185 years ago. There was a big earthquake. So, but we got the age in the top, but in the bottom we didn't want the age. So we cannot conclusively say that. So then we removed that from our uh, studies. Maybe from the audience, do you have questions? I mean, the audience um, online, Zoom. No questions. Yeah, go ahead. I don't think that they actually hear. Yeah. Uh, 
example, for example, in some places you show that if you have these mosquitoes, that you have more or less. How do you know that it's really a like, true um, proxy for COVID and not a proxy for the degeneration state? That's a very interesting question because. Uh, when I started my PhD, I was not aware of any other process other than biomarker activity. So on my way, when I was working in your lab, looking at the microscope, I found uh, these uh, micro species, and we contacted respective labs that were expertise in doing this analysis, and they were very helpful to teach me this analysis, like osteopods, pyramids, and uh, they, they helped me too. So when uh, we tested these chromids also for the other leg, but we didn't find them. There were only few who had it actually. So we have to make sure that we have some, uh, we have to like the value test and everything to see that whether the number of the red capsules are significant or not. If the p-value is less, we try to avoid with the, the bellablan interpretation. But for the second leg, we had few intervals with very preservation of red capsules. But yeah, it's a very interesting work. This pyramids I also was not aware of this. Yeah. Okay, so I think we have the of the the because I see that when you use calcium by iron like proxy to differentiate between the rolling and all those things. Why I'm asking this question? Because uh, if, if uh, you have the oxygen difference, which is not really happening between the dry ketone, but the share of the calcite will be very high in perfect relation. So I would like to correct your statement. The calcite doesn't represent erosion. It doesn't represent erosion. They are primary sources. So that indicates the more abundance of calcium. We have also calcite, we have also gypsum, and we have also iron. So these are basically your price, and it's like a you already know this. Right? So um, the higher value of calcium majorly represents the abundance of chips. And we did petrophysical analysis. We did uh, obviously we did mineralogy, we did SEM, we also did three sections confirmed, but obviously we didn't look at the calcite structure, that whether it's elongated or which one is which kind of calcite. But thank you for the question. Yeah. Um. Nobody in the Zoom wants to ask a question. Okay, I'm just rechecking. Um, okay, so if no more questions, so we have to go and uh, see you next week. Okay. Maybe we will organize a party for Dr. Carl. A uh, mail will be sent. We need to organize it. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>